Hello, my name is Daniele Podini. I am the department chair at uh, George Washington University in the Department of Forensic Sciences. I'm uh, also a forensic molecular biology, and today I will be talking to you about some of the research that we've been doing in my laboratory. The title of the talk is Microhaplotypes, the Next Generation Forensic DNA Markers. <clears throat> So uh, mixtures, DNA mixtures, they represent probably one of the greatest challenges in forensic DNA analysis. And there's many reasons for that. There's sample degradation uh, can affect uh, the, the quality of the, of the mixture, uh, allele sharing between contributors, um, allele dropout, um, and PCR artifacts such as stutter. And this is obviously with the conventional um, DNA marker used in, in, our, in our field, which are short tandem repeats. Mastery parallel sequencing of, of SDRs or short tandem repeats can increase the ability of deconvolute mixtures. Uh, the fact that we can sequence SDR and e alleles can <clears throat> enable the individualization of some alleles that have the same size but different sequences. It can also uh, allow um, to minimize fragment length so we can increase the, the, the sensitivity of the assay when the DNA is degraded. And in some cases, it can distinguish between a stutter, so an artifact of a major contributor in a mixture, uh, with an allele that overlaps, convention, normally would overlap with the um, with, uh, stutter of the major contributor of the minor contributor and so if we can distinguish those uh, by by sequence that obviously is an advantage in uh, determining for example the number of contributors and determining the ratio between the major and the minor uh, and obviously um, in the past couple of years we've seen uh, uh, probabilistic genotyping can really help uh, mixture deconvolution uh, via SDRs but when we talk about massively parallel sequencing, this um, theoretical advantage that it would offer is, is actually not, not so straightforward. Here we have an example of a Leo 22 of a locus, of uh, one of the codis loci D12. And uh, a Leo 20, the sequence of a Leo 22 has, uh, in this particular case, 13 AGAT and then 8 AGAC and 1 a G A T, and if you look uh, in position uh, of allele twenty one and also of allele twenty, there's uh, there's two stutter, so a, a minus four, <clears throat> excuse me, a one is minus four stutter, that is actually composed of of two different sequences. In fact, during the the, the creation of the stutter, so the the slippage of the polymerase, we have a loss. 60%, uh, 16% of that stutter is a loss of one repeat. So it goes from uh, 13 AGAT to 12. But the AGAC remain eight, whereas 6% of the stutter, uh, or 6% of the whole percentage, is um, a slippage at the AGAC. So from one single allele, uh, allele 22, which is the original allele of the, the individual, the, the actual DNA contributor, we have two different stutters. And then we have the stutter of the stutter. And then we have the plus four stutter. So with a single, a single allele, uh, we're actually generating another five artifacts. So if you can imagine that if there's a minor contributor there uh, whose DNA is at the level of the stutter, it gets really difficult to interpret which allele uh, is an actual artifact versus one uh, being a stutter, obviously, if it's in stutter position. So although uh, mastery of parallel sequence has the potential to increase the capability of deconvoluting mixtures, it still has a lot of challenges. And, and to model these different types of artifacts in probabilistic genotyping, it's very complex. It's not something that's really straightforward. And this is where microhaplotypes come in. Microhaplotypes are a novel forensic DNA uh, marker that was initially thought by uh, Professor Ken Kidd from Yale University. And what they are are a set of SNPs within a fragment that can be amplified. So 
approximately you know 300 nucleotides or less and the smaller these fragments the greater their sensitivity in um, in de degraded dna and in this fragment that can be amplified we have multiple SNPs, and the pattern of these SNPs, so the association between the SNP alleles, creates different haplotypes. So normally with the Sanger sequencing, which is the kind of the old sequencing method that's been used uh, for, for several years, the entire human genome uh, project was based with uh, Sanger, was based on Sanger sequencing. Uh, you see right there, you see a GC, sorry, a CG, a CG, and then two AGs. And we don't know, based on, on Sanger sequencing, if that first C is associated to the second C or whether it's associated to the G, meaning on which chromosome they are. But with massively parallel sequencing, we can actually separate the two chromosomes because we clonally sequence each individual chromosome. And so in this case, we're able to see that one haplotype, so for example, the, the one that's inherited by the father, we have a CC a, A, and whereas the other chromosome is GG, GG. And so those two are essentially, those two haplotypes are essentially two alleles, but you can have multiple combinations, okay? So that's what a, a microhaplotype is. And the advantages of, of using microhaplotypes are several. Uh, they, uh, first of all, uh, there's no stutter there be, because there's, there's not a re sequence that's repeated multiple times as the polymerase amplifies that region, there's no slippage. And obviously, they can be selected appropriately. So, so the, the efficiency of, of the amplification is high. They are SNPs. So uh, they're based on SNPs. So the mutation rate is a lot lower than short tandem repeats. And, and so they, they, are, they can be very useful in uh, relationship testing. Uh, they... Um, can be useful because there's no stutter and <clears throat> because there's this, uh, uh, because there's no stutter in an imbalanced mixture, uh, you and you, you would not have the issue that you have with STRs where stutters can overlap with alleles of the minor contributor. That, that issue is absent. Modeling in uh, probabilistic genotyping uh, is much easier because you don't have the stutter issue at all. And uh, also, all the alleles within the same locus have the same size. With SDRs, you may have alleles that are much larger than others because they may have a lot more repeats. And so this gives uh, the larger allele an amplification disadvantage if there's inhibition or if uh, the DNA is degraded. So you don't have that issue. So <clears throat> there are several advantages. There are some disadvantages, of course, for example, uh, they are less polymorphic than SDRs. So you need to increase the number of loci that you amplify, that you co-amplify in, in multiplex to get the same power of discrimination that you have with SDRs. So designing a multiplex assay may be more complex. And obviously, although I don't have it on this slide, they're based on massively parallel sequencing, which is you know, more expensive, at least right now. And going forward, I think uh, ma massively parallel sequencing will improve, the throughput will increase, there will be a, a better way to increase the number of samples that you can an analyze at the same time. And so uh, there's, you know, it's very promising. So uh, in, as I said earlier, uh, Professor Kidd is the one that thought of this and he started publishing paper, the first paper was, uh, as I show here, in 2013. And there were and he was the one that mostly published for the, for the first five years on this. But then there was an explosion of, of uh, papers, and there's actually more that, are, that have come out and are, are coming out, uh, including a couple that we submitted and we're, we're waiting for the reviewers to uh, get back to us. Uh, so it, the community has really, uh, there's consensus in the community that this is actually a good forensic DNA marker. So we received uh, funding from NIJ to develop an assay based on a panel that was identified by Dr. Kidd in collaboration with others, including our group. We selected a subset of this panel based on two parameters. One is AE, or effective number of alleles, and the other parameter was 
uh, is informative. So the effective number of allele is essentially um, how it tells us how discriminating is this particular locus. Uh, so essentially the, the, the distribution of the alleles that this particular locus has and, uh, and how balanced is the allele frequency of the alleles that are identified for this locus. The informativeness instead tells us how unique are certain alleles to certain populations. So in essence, uh, AE allows us to discriminate individuals uh, within the same population or across population. Within, whereas the informativeness, a higher informativeness, gives us uh, the ability to discriminate between individuals from different populations. So we selected a panel based on that, and uh, we um, analyzed multiple samples. The throughput, uh, the, the process of the analysis was uh, first uh, the library prep preparation. We, we did both manual and uh, using students as part of their projects, and also uh, automated uh, library prep. Then we did uh, what's called chip uh, templating. Well, the templating and loading on the chip. So, so the libraries get uh, go through a process of emulsion PCR, and then eventually they get uh, purified and loaded onto the chip. And then they were sequenced on the Ion S5. So this is the um, Ion S5 uh, MPS uh, platform. Then we worked on um, pipelines for bioinformatic pipelines to process the data uh, using some that were provided by Thermo Fishers, uh, other, others that we developed. And the final output uh, in this particular case kind of mimics what uh, uh, conventional SDR analysis looks like. So we have a, in this case, we have a bar as opposed to having a peak and the height of the bar represents how many individual reads of that particular sequence uh, have been found. And at the bottom, you see A, G, and G, G are the two alleles, meaning A and one on one chromosome, we have at the first SNP an A, at the second SNP a G. In the other chromosome, we have two Gs. And these are not necessarily contiguous. They can be separated, as I showed you in the previous slide. And we did several studies. So I'm, I'm going to go through some of them here. Uh, I don't have time to go through all of them, but if anybody's interested, they can contact me and we can talk about it. Uh, so we did a, a mixture study. Oh, the first is the sensitivity. So the sensitivity that we we were able to obtain, we obtained full profiles down to 50 picograms of input DNA, which is a very similar, if not better than uh, most of the conventional SDR kits that uh, are commercially used by Prime Labs right now. So we developed uh, multiple mixtures, uh, starting from 10 to 1 to 20 to 1, 40 to 1, even down to 80 to 1. Uh, and then we did multiple contributors. And, and this slide kind of shows you the distribution of types of mixtures that we looked at. We obtained um, full profiles for most of them, obviously, as we increase the ratio between the major and the minor, we're we're inputting always less amount of DNA of the minor, given that the overall amount of DNA, as, as you can see on the right of the slide, is one nanogram. So as you increase the ratio between the two, uh, you're always putting in less and less of the minor contributor. So we started seeing some, as expected, some allele dropout in the 20 to 1, a lot of allele dropout in the 40 to 1, um, and the complete dropout of the minor contributor in the, in the 80 to 1 which was expected. We analyzed those mixtures in multiple ways. So we used our microhaplotype assay. We also used the, the conventional uh, global filer kit with the capillary electrophoresis, the 24 loci uh, assay that is you know, been validated in many laboratories. And then we used the, the new Precision ID Global Filer NGS, NGS SDR panel version two. And that is that includes all the 24 low side that are in the conventional CE uh, Global Filer, plus an additional set of low side uh, that increase the, the power discrimination uh, of the assay. So we analyze the same mixture with the same amount of DNA in these three different ways. And here uh, are the data. So this is an example of talking about sensitivity, uh, 20, to, uh, 20 to 1 ratio. As we 
expect we see some dropout of the minor contributor with conventional CE. So for example, at uh, locus D3, we see the 16 and the 18 of the minor contributor that are very low. Uh, the w, WA, we see the 18. Then we see some dropout, uh, and some are masked. So for example, at locus CSF 1PO, uh, the minor contributor is almost like a 12, which is obviously masked in this case by the major, who is 912. Um, the 40 to 1 ratio, as, as we expect, uh, we don't see any of the minor contributor with uh, conventional CE. When uh, looking at the same uh, um, samples but tested with uh, massively parallel sequencing global filer kit, we uh, end up getting a little bit more information of the minor contributor. Uh, again, this the, the just to navigate you through this plot. The, the height of the bar represent the individual sequences, and um, the number underneath each bar represents the allele call. And that th so th these are sequenced, meaning the software reads the the, the sequence uh, that's, that's generated by the, by the sequencing on the chip, and then it counts the individual re repeats, and then it develops this this output. So it's it's um, kind of an our artificial, really artificial output, as opposed to the peaks that we were seeing in the previous uh, slide, which are, you know, a, a con the height of the, the peak is actually a consequence of the amount of fluorescence that is generated by the PCR product as it goes through the capillary. Uh, so uh, almost complete dropout, well, uh, so at the 20 to 1 ratio, we see a lot of the minor contributor more than we were seeing with CE. In the 40 to 1 ratio, essentially, we see a complete dropout. We see a few elevated stutters, like uh, in the D4S uh, 2408. We see a little bit of the 10 that is uh, slightly above the stutter threshold. But this is cannot be considered uh, reliable because we haven't, this is a new kit, we hadn't done a, a thorough actual internal validation. So we don't have stutter threshold. We're just using the ones that are uh, that were given by default. And again, there's, there's not been enough uh, processing of this kit to be able to determine whether that 10 is actually above the stutter threshold, meaning there's the minor contributor that's, con that's increasing the, the read count. Uh, okay. Now, the same mixtures with uh, microhaplotypes, we see a significant amount of alleles of the minor contributor at the 20 to 1 ratio, where at the 40 to 1 ratio, obviously, we have more dropout, but we're still detecting a, a good amount of alleles of the minor, uh, 54 to be, to be specific, and uh, 22 alleles of the minor contributor. And we'll see uh, later, I have a slide uh, showing that the random match probability that is generated with just these 22 alleles of the minor contributor is sufficient, is, is strong, it's, pre it's pretty powerful. We're getting, you know, uh, one in a million or around that area. So, so we're going from a, a sequence, uh, sorry, um, a profile that's analyzed with CE that yields nothing, 40 to 1, we didn't get anything, to something that can give us a random match probability of 1 in a million. So it's a, it's a very uh, powerful uh, technique. Now, the idea here, okay, we've, we've seen that it, it actually has the, the potential of, uh, I'm not going to say replace SDRs because SDRs are here to stay. There's an, enorm an enormous inertia of you know, the convicted offender database that has you know, millions and millions of, of profiles, uh, SDR profiles. There's forensic uh, profiles within CODIS that are obviously useful, potentially useful to identify offenders that haven't been uh, officially typed yet. So SDRs are, are here to stay, but it has the potential to enhance mixture deconvolution or to complement SDRs. But in order for this to happen, we have to make them attractive to uh, forensic scientists. So, so how can we make them attractive? So, um, first of all, there has to be user-friendly software, and that makes it easier uh, to, to 
to look at the sample, and it has to be robust. Uh, developing a bioinformatic pipeline is not as easy as I thought, at least when I got into this field. Uh, uh, you know, the, the converting um, so the the, out, the conventional output is pretty straightforward from CE. So the the amount of fluorescent generates a signal that's detected and kind of plotted into you know that graphical representation then that we're so used to. Uh, the, the bioinformatics, there's a lot of noise, there's so many more samples, it's something that cannot be done manually. So it's it's a lot more complex complex. Then we need allele frequency because if we uh, allele frequencies are what allows us to determine the frequency of a profile. So we have a match between the evidence and a suspect, but we can't just say it's a match. We have to provide a statistical significance of this match, or call it random match probability, we call it likelihood ratio, it depends. And then they have to be amenable to probabilistic genotyping. It, it's, the software is complex enough. Uh, the, the number of loci are, are much greater than than with SDRs because you want to you want to obtain. A, as I said earlier, you, you need more loci to obtain the same discrimination power. So you can't really do it manually. And as we've seen in the in the community, everybody's shifting to probably seeing genotyping because it makes things so much more consistent, much more straightforward. Or challenges to it, but this is something that would be a must for microhaplotypes to be implemented. And finally, there has to be an international consensus on the on the final panel that we want to use as a community. And that is really crucial. And I'm not going to talk about it now because um, I, I really haven't been working on this right now uh, directly, but it's something that's extremely important because that is what's going to allow the companies, the, the manufacturers of, the, of these kit, these molecular biology kit, to, to then decide whether it's worth investing their resources in developing a panel. So there has to be consensus between the community on which are the low side to type. So user-friendly software. So we here is an example of um, of a kind of an alpha version of a plugin uh, or, uh, for armed expert, and, and this is um, thanks to Brian Young. You see his picture at the bottom of the left, uh, and obviously this doesn't doesn't tell you much. I have I zoomed into one of them. So here is um, just a, a plot a plotting of. The results of a, of a set of uh, microhaps uh, of our panel. The, again, the height of the bar represents the coverage, meaning how many sequences uh, have been identified with that particular pattern. The label on the top shows you the allele call. And right now, they've been labeled with, um, with a particular code, but that can be adapted to uh, any, anything we want. The, the locus name is at the top. And uh, the, the two alleles are, are what you see at the bottom. So the bar represents the, the, the individual allele. So, so as you can see now, this, this saw, there's some imbalance. This is a single source sample. So ideally, you would want um, you know, one peak when the individual is homozygote or two balanced sorry, bars, I should say, uh, when the um, alleles, when, there's, when the individual is heterozygote. But we see, like in the center, uh, where uh, it says unique identification code, right in the center, you see that there's two alleles for that locus, and they're significantly imbalanced. There's almost twice the amount of one versus the other. So that's a, a, a bioinformatic issue. So we, we have to optimize the, the pipeline in order to clean better and to identify which ones are, are the actual alleles. Uh, and, and you see a couple of those also. Also, we want to try and and, and that's more kind of a, a PCR primer concentration as you try to balance the, the, all the different uh, loci so, so that the coverage is similar across the loci. But this is an example of how we would want a software. So you, you kind of select the sample, you run the software, and you get these bars. And then obviously the output is that you have to be exported into a table that can be used for uh, comparison. Uh, and if it's a mixture, there could be some manual interpretation, initial manual interpretation. But this is a good way to visualize the sample. And it's attractive to old school uh, uh, 
DNA analysts that are used to looking at, at peaks, right? The, uh, the bioinformatician doesn't really look at this anymore. So this is really for, for us uh, molecular biologists or DNA analysts. In terms of allele frequencies, we've uh, uh, generated, um, uh, we've, we've sequenced uh, several samples uh, for, uh, for the purpose of generating allele frequencies for the major U.S. populations, so African-American, European-Americans, uh, East Asian-American, Southwest Hispanics. And we've, we've typed also um, over 800 samples from 14 different populations throughout the world. So we, we have uh, the allele frequencies that, that can be used already uh, on, on the set that we've, on the 74 uh, haplotypes that we've analyzed. And we've also tested how well we could use microhaps to predict the ancestry of, a, of an individual. So for that, we used the allele frequencies that were generated uh, for many more populations across the world by Dr. Ken Kidd and, and his uh, lab. And here is a, an example uh, of how ancestry prediction could be done. So here, these are individuals of, of African descent. And uh, what you see, uh, what you see uh, is, so the plot represents the frequency of each individual profile in all the populations that are listed on the top of that graph. So uh, and these are 20 individuals of, uh, of Af African-American descent, so that's their biogeographic ancestry. And as you can see, the frequency of their profile is higher in populations from Africa. So... As you move from uh, from left to right, at a certain point, there's a drop, which corresponds to uh, allele frequencies that were from individuals of European descent. And although on the graph, there's not much difference, but each one of those lines, those uh, horizontal lines, is three orders of magnitude. So so in essence, uh, the, the, the as you drop, uh, what is it, one, two, three, or four lines, it's like 12 orders of, of magnitude uh, difference in terms of the frequency of that profile in that population. So you clearly see a pattern of individuals from of, of African-American descent. Uh, these are Europeans, and again, you see that their frequency bumps up when we're using the, the frequency, the overall frequency of the profile comes up when, you're, when we're looking at... Uh, when we're using allele frequencies from uh, European individuals. Uh, these are East Asians, and, um, and these are uh, Southwest Hispanic individuals. And as Southwest Hispanic are actually uh, an admix between uh, Europeans and Native Americans. And you see that the frequency goes up in, in both, which is what we would expect. Here's an example of the, those are kind of the averages that I of the plots that I showed you before, and you see also and this is a single individual in purple that was um, a profile from uh, a Native American individual, and you see that the frequency is relatively low across Africa and Europe. It goes out up a bit in East Asia, and then it goes up again, significantly up, obviously, in uh, when we use allele frequencies from individuals of Native American descent. So this shows you that uh, they actually have the potential to uh, provide some, the, some ancestry information. And here's kind of a different approach. So we're using a multivariate statistical approach that, that uh, uses a logistic regression and PCA combined. And uh, uh, these are some of our samples. And as you can see, the, the plots, the, the individuals are are well separated into different parts of the plot. So this is another approach. So you would add an unknown individual, the software would plot it in, in one of these positions. And so you could use this as a, as a method to predict the ancestry. Now we're still working on this part, uh, but it definitely has potential. And this is in collaboration with uh, the uh, Carabinieri group of, of Rome and the University La Sapienza, who's, who've been uh, using this statistical approach on SDRs uh, showing some really promising data. And so because microhaps carry more ancestry information than SDRs, it is like it, it at least our preliminary data, we're seeing that that it has the potential to really help uh, in this 
process. Uh, this is a kind of a, an example of combining uh, mixture interpretation and ancestry prediction. So on, um, on the left, we have the likelihood ratio of uh, the, the observing uh, this particular profile uh, if it's an individual of European American descent versus in blue, uh, a European, uh, an individual uh, of African American descent, meaning uh, that's it's ten times to the sixteen times more likely to observe this particular profile if it's a Euro European, if, it, if the DNA came from a European versus an African American, uh, whereas uh, the red bar uh, shows shows us that it's about approximately a thousand times more likely to observe this profile if it's an individual of European descent than if it's an individual from Hispanic descent. And um, again, European versus Asian is a, is a lot higher. So, and this is for the alleles of the minor contributor in the 20 to one, this is uh, to the left. And to the right, it is for the 40 to one. On the right side, you see the random match probability. So you see that the random match probability uh, for the profile uh, is, in the and, and that is kind of the average is uh, in you know the 10 to the 19 so we're talking trillions of trillions so it's a very very high number um, and this is for the minor contributor of the 20 to 1. the minor contributor of the 40 to 1 uh, that profile is around uh, one in a million so it's still uh, pretty strong, although the ancestry information that we're getting out of the 40 to 1 is, is not as informative. The conclusion here is that we could say that the, the minor contributor of the 20 to 1 mixture is um, most likely of, of individual uh, of European descent, possibly Hispanic descent, but we can probably exclude uh, or, or assume extremely unlikely that the individual is of African American descent or uh, East Asian American descent. Probably least genotyping, and this is the research that we're currently working on. Um, so taking uh, the data, uh, that the, the output data uh, from uh, uh, our bioinformatic pipelines, and then throwing it into probabilistic genotyping to see if it works. And for this, we've been uh, working on using LR Mix Studio, which is a semi-continuous model that basically doesn't look at uh, the height of the peak, so the amount of DNA, but simply looks at the presence or absence of alleles. And then we, in collaboration with Dr. Charles Brenner, we've been um, using DNA View Mixture Solution who uh, that was adapted by Dr. Brenner to in, import inputting or yeah, importing uh, microhap data. And I don't have many examples here in the interest of time, but we've demonstrated that it actually works pretty well and, and microhaps are, are a good, um, uh, a good tool that can be easily adapted to probably genotyping because of its characteristics that I mentioned earlier. You don't have to model stutter, uh, fragment, you don't have to model uh, size between alleles of the same locus as you have to do with SDRs. And so it's, it's actually working pretty well. And this is an example of um, a five-person mixture uh, where the hypothesis uh, are that uh, either it's a mixture between two individual B and C plus three unknowns or uh, four, uh, sorry, a mixture of five individuals, B and C, but plus three unknowns, or B plus plus four unknowns. So, in this, essentially, the person of interest is Mr. C in this case, which is, in this particular case, was the in, in intermediate contributor, so the one that's at five. And so, a, a mixture solution is able to very effectively deconvolute the mixture and attribute the alleles to the different individuals, particularly the, the intermediate person. And it gives us, uh, you know, one uh, times 10 to the 78 uh, likelihood ratio, uh, which uh, I don't know even how to say it in terms of, of um, 
you know, trillions of quadrillions or whatever it is. Whereas um, LRMX Studio uh, gives us, uh, you know, eight times 10 to the three. So you would say it's 8,000 8, times more likely to observe this mixture if it's a mixture between B, C, and three unknowns than if it's the mixture between B and four unknowns. And we, we expect that LRMX Studio doesn't have the same power of, of uh, deconvolution because it, it's not using peak heights or uh, in this case coverage. So this kind of demonstrates that these are uh, that microhaps are a good marker for for probabilistic genotyping. Now we wanted to take it a step uh, further. So we we've been focusing on the SNPs that define the microhap. So the the ones that initially Dr. Kidd identified. These are This is an example of an amplicon, and those red bars represent the location of the individual SNPs. So these are the ones that define the locus. So the, the profile, you know, A, 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 G, G, or, you know, A at the first red bar, A at the second red bar, G and G at the third and fourth red bars. Okay, but, but there's a lot of real estate there, a lot of sequences that we've initially been ignoring. So our initial pipeline was actually only focusing on the four SNPs. But there's a, yeah there's a, a lot of potential uh, genetic variation that can occur there, and the, the greater the number of loci that we're analyzing, so the greater the number of this this genetic real estate that we're looking at, the greater are the chances that an individual has a rare SNP that is identified. So here is an example. Of These are the two uh, microhaps that define the, sorry, the two SNPs that define the microhap. But then if you look at the, uh, all those potential SNPs that haven't been identified, uh, they can, there can be variation there. And some of it may be not informative because maybe it's completely linked with the allele that we are already genotyping, uh, but others may not be. And here's an example of, a, of an individual that is homozygote GA based on uh, focusing on the two SNPs that define the microhap. But when we actually go and sequence the individual, we see that there's another um, SNP variation right there that is extremely rare. As you can see, it's been identified uh, very rarely in uh, uh, individuals of African descent. Uh, but uh, in, uh, it's been virtually not seen in all the other populations. So, so this, this individual now becomes heterozygote. So we, it goes from homozygote to heterozygote. Not only that, but it increases the power of discrimination, this profile, incredibly. So in a mixture, for example, we would be able to, again, discriminate. It. But by adding this rare allele, uh, which would be GGA, we in, increase the... Um, the power of discrimination uh, and the chances of also in the, identifying the number of contributors to a mixture. The um, next frontier of these microhaps is uh, already being um, kind of addressed by, by Dr. Kidd, who is now focused on identifying microhaps that are very small. And the advantage of these Uh, small microhaps is that they're going to be a lot more effective on extremely degraded DNA. So uh, SDRs go from approximately 100 uh, onward. Uh, and with massively parallel sequencing, maybe you can stay within, you know, between 100 and 200, 250, something like that. So uh, we're, it's, DNA is not uh, that big fragments, but But if the DNA is significantly degraded, you're not going to get a good profile. If you focus on fragments that are smaller than 50 base pairs, you can, you can actually uh, increase the discrimination power. And so here are, um, here's a structure plot of uh, 108 uh, uh, microhaps that are smaller than 50 base pairs. And as you can see, they have, uh, they have a very good informativeness and Uh, although it's not shown in the slide, they, they also have a good uh, AE. So they have a great potential uh, for uh, typing uh, degraded DNA where SDRs would fail. 
So uh, here are the various things that we're still working on, uh, improving our mixture to convolution, isotopy prediction, degraded DNA, looking at relationship testing, how effective they are, and not only you know father, child, but uh, uh, siblings, step siblings, uh, cousins, and so forth. Uh, we're in the process of publishing the um, uh, allele frequencies and the mixture studies, and also op optimizing the bioinformatic pipeline, which is not a small undertaking. With that, I also uh, want to thank uh, all the people that worked at the data you've seen. There's all um, the GW students, uh, particularly uh, Fabio Oldoni, who is um, the one on the right uh, of the picture on the bottom right. You see me, uh, Ken, Kid, and uh, Fabio, who's, who's done a lot of work here. And also all the, the students of the program. Uh, here we see in this picture, there's Lina, there's Chiara, Satya, Ishwarya, Drew, myself, and Fabio again. So they've, they've all um, helped a lot. And other students uh, that I won't there's too many to mention, but also and especially NIJ for funding the research that we've been uh, working on. That without their help, the help of Thermo Fisher, Mitch Vision, uh, uh, we wouldn't have been able to uh, generate this data for them. Thank you so much.